I'm a theoretical computer scientist in a math department working on machine learning and statistics. So what I'm going to be talking about today is about high dimensional robust statistics and revisiting these from the perspectives of algorithm design. But before I get to high dimensional robust statistics, maybe we should start off with one dimensional robust statistics. And actually, before we get there, maybe let's just start off with statistics. So in fact, um, you know, there's a general family of problems which is called parameter estimation. These are old problems that date back 100 years. And you can think about a prototypical problem here is you're given samples from some unknown distribution, but you're promised that it lives in some nice class. So the prototypical example we'll be talking about is imagine you're given samples from a Gaussian. You know it's a Gaussian. You just don't know what its underlying parameter mu is, its mean, and its variance sigma squared. And the question you can ask is, you know, given samples from this distribution, can I accurately estimate its parameters, the things that uniquely determine the distribution? And the answer to this is a duh, of course you can. Uh, in fact, there are really simple ways to do this. All you have to do is you take a bunch of samples, x1 through xn, take the empirical mean, that's going to converge very quickly to the true mean mu, and you can take the empirical variance. So here x bar is the empirical mean, that's also going to converge really quickly. In fact, these two statistics, the empirical mean and the empirical variance, are examples of a more general paradigm, which started with the work of Fisher, which is really called maximum likelihood estimation. So trying to find the parameters which maximize the chance of generating the samples that you were given. And this has all sorts of wonderful properties. One of the most impressive properties about it is something called asymptotic efficiency, which informally what this means is that if you take the problem sizes fixed and send the number of samples to infinity, the maximum likelihood estimators under pretty tame conditions will converge the true parameters at the fastest possible rate. That's great. Now, there are all sorts of troubles with it, like it's computationally hard to compute, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what else you can do in the face of computationally hard estimators. But this talk is really about a different breed of question. One which could have been asked a lot earlier, but really started in the work of John Tukey and others, in which he asked, all right, so the maximum likelihood estimator is the best you can do when you're really given samples from an actual Gaussian or something else in your parametric family. But what happens if there are errors in the model itself? Because no model is perfect. So what types of estimators behave well in some kind of neighborhood around the true model? So let me explain robust parameter estimation in one dimension before we start going to high dimensions where there are going to be all sorts of interesting phenomena that happen. But this is at a high level what's going on. We'll dig into the details because it's really important to get the formulation right. So in robust parameter estimation in 1D, you can think about instead of actually getting samples from your ideal model, something like a Gaussian, what happens if someone adds a little bit of wiggle, some kind of noise, so that what you actually get is some other model that looks like a Gaussian but isn't really a Gaussian. So what can you do in the face of this kind of noise? Can you still meaningfully estimate the underlying parameters you cared about? Can you denoise the observed model? So you know, let me get into how exactly we're going to set up this problem formally. This is really important. Uh, so the first question to make this precise is how do we constrain the noise? So there are a few ways to think about this. You know, one of the most popular ways is thinking about you know, this little wiggle that we've added to the PDF. We can constrain its L1 norm. So let's say that the L1 norm of this little wiggle, the noise we added to our PDF, is at most epsilon. Uh, there's another more intuitive way to think about this, which is if you superpose the ideal model and the actual observed model, you can think about the region between these two curves as that wiggle. And that's the region where some kind of adversary is actually changing your distribution. So one way to think about this is that you're allowing an adversary to corrupt an epsilon fraction of your samples and do whatever he wants with them. So this actually generalizes something called Huber's contamination model. And if you're interested, actually, all the things I'm going to tell you will work with the strongest version of this, which is an adversary can look at your samples and then decide which epsilon fraction of the samples he wants to corrupt, and he can do whatever he wants with them. So in fact, that's not even a change in the PDF, because the samples aren't necessarily IID. That's not so important. Uh, but let me add one more piece of terminology here, which is that I'm going to refer to the outliers, the things that the adversary has corrupted, the things he got his hands on, and the inliers are just whatever he hasn't touched. 
Now, the only remaining thing we have to do to really set up this problem is now that we have our constraint on the noise, what the adversary is allowed to do to try and mess up our estimators, things like maximum likelihood estimation, the natural question is how do we set up our goal? So what do we mean by estimating the parameters in the presence of noise? So of course, there's something called the total variation distance, which so is just half of the L1 distance between the PDFs. But you think about it, that's actually the way that we've constrained how much the adversary can move our problem. You know, the constraint we had on the L1 norm means that when we start off with the ideal model, the adversary is allowed to create any other distribution that's about epsilon far in total variation. So, you know, if this is the norm we're using to measure how much the adversary can change our problem, it's also the natural norm to use to ask how we should set up our goal. So you can think about this goal in a few different ways is given something that's epsilon close to being a Gaussian, can we find an estimate that's about epsilon close to the original uncorrupted thing? So can we find something that's close in the same norm that we're allowing our adversary to move the distribution? Or you could even think about it as, you know, this actually is the real data, it's not quite a Gaussian, but can we find the approximately best fit within a nice class of models like Gaussians? So this is the way we're going to set up our problem. And you know, there's a next natural question, which is I told you about maximum likelihood estimation. Now we can ask, all right, so when we were given samples from an actual Gaussian, we knew that the empirical mean and empirical variance were the best we can do. But do they work in the presence of noise? So the answer here is a resounding no. Uh, because what the adversary could do is he could just add a tiny little bump way out there in the tails. That could just be one sample, but as he sends that off to infinity, the trouble is that this empirical mean on the right-hand side is now diverging. It's going to infinity. Same with the variance. So uh, some of you can probably guess what's next, so we better fix this problem first. So instead of the empirical mean, anyone have any ideas what we ought to use? Median. The median. All right, let me ask a harder question. So if the median works instead of the mean, well, what should we do instead of the empirical variance? Anyone have any guesses? Absolute deviation. Yeah, let's just use median a bunch of times. So you could use median absolute deviation. You could use interquartile range. So all right, so the idea is that when you use the median, you know, even if the adversary adds that bump outside, he doesn't pull you too far away from you know, the actual mean of the distribution. And the same way, what you can do is you can use a median of medians, or the median absolute deviation. So you take your samples, you take their median, and you look at the absolute value of the difference between them and the median, and you take the median of those values. So all sorts of things work in one dimension. These are called robust estimates of location and scale, respectively. And this is the prototypical theorem. In fact, this theorem is so basic, I don't even know where to attribute it to. But this is you know, what you can do in one dimension. So if you're given samples from a distribution that's epsilon close, remember we're in total variation as the norm to a Gaussian, then if you compute the median and median absolute deviation, you have to add a correction term. That's this phi inverse of 3 quarters, just to make sure that the median absolute deviation is an unbiased estimator when there isn't noise. But what you have is that uh, your parameters, mu hat and sigma hat squared, are so close that they're within a constant times epsilon of the original Gaussian. So this is perfect, because it's the best of all possible worlds. It's provably robust. And it's obviously computationally efficient because you compute the median by computing the median. That's a question. Yep. All of this is under the assumption of additive noise, right? No. So I'm actually, this all works under the stronger assumption that you're even allowed subtractive noise. And in fact, the adversary is even allowed to look at the samples that come from the ideal distribution and then, then decide which things to change. But there's, so the, mm -hmm. yeah, there's no multiplicative, multiplicative noise because it, it could zero out a lot of stuff, right? Uh, what do you mean? So like you're multiplying by a noise that's zero in a certain certain in a certain range. Then as long as you corrupt an epsilon fraction of the distribution, like the samples, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the natural notions of additive would be what's called the Huber contamination model. Now it's not so important which one we're going to work with, but if you're curious, these are going to work with one of the strongest possible. All right, so in the nomenclature of theoretical computer science, what this would be called is it would be called properly agnostically learning a 1D Gaussian. 
So it's agnostic because you're agnostic to the fact that it really is a Gaussian. You're just saying that if there is a really good fit for it being very close to a Gaussian, then you want to find something that's also a very good fit. And it's called proper because my estimate that I want to find should also be a Gaussian because that's the family I care about. So the main question of this talk, which I can finally get to, is what happens to robust estimation in high dimensions? So previously we didn't have this tension between algorithm design and robustness, but we're going to. Yeah? Quick question before the high dimensions. Yeah? You blend in your Yeah, so here, uh, let me be more precise. So the number of samples that you need if you want failure probability delta is log one over delta all over epsilon squared times some constant. So what I'll care about is polynomial time, uh, polynomial sample complexity. But because the running times of the natural things are going to be exponential, I'm not really going to emphasize the sample complexity, but all the sample complexities have polynomial and effective bounds. But great question. All right, so now uh, let's do robust estimation in high dimensions. Actually, the thing I want you to keep in mind, we'll get back to this with experiments, is think about what if you're doing estimation in really high dimensions where you can't visualize your data anymore? You know, what if you're doing some kind of microarray analysis with tens of thousands of genes? See, and you know, this is a beautiful story in one dimension, but it doesn't change the fact that if you're talking about robust estimation of this bump that's out in the tails, you could have eyeballed that and picked that bump out. But all of a sudden, when you're in high dimensions, finding the directions where adversaries have added corruptions is actually a really non-trivial thing because you can't naively visualize your data. All right, so now I want to explain to you why there's an issue here. So you know, there's, a, there's something interesting that happens in high dimensions, which is there's a tension between robustness and algorithms. So the problem that I'm going to focus on is exactly the one you would expect. You're given samples from a high dimensional Gaussian, actually something that's epsilon close to being a high dimensional Gaussian. So it has some d dimensional vector mu, uh, it's mean vector, and it has some d by d matrix sigma, which is its covariance. So you're given samples not from a true Gaussian, but something that's epsilon close to being a Gaussian. Think of it as 0.1 if you want. And what you care about is finding mu hat and sigma hat so that you're close again in the total variation distance. So one thing I want to emphasize is that it's really important to, you know, in high dimensions, set up your problem appropriately. That's why I want to set it up with total variation distance. See, I could have measured the distance between my parameters some other way. Like I could have looked at the spectral norm between sigma and sigma hat or the Frobenius norm. The trouble is that those things could differ by a factor of d in high dimensions. So you want to make sure that you're being honest and not hiding the fact that your algorithm is suboptimal with how you're measuring the parameters. This is, I think, the ideal way to set it up because all you're given in the promise is that you're epsilon close in TV and you want to be 10 epsilon close in TV in high dimensions without any Ds showing up. So there are two important special cases of this problem which I'm going to focus on almost entirely. So one is where I give you some extra promise that actually I'm going to make your life easier. The covariance is the identity. So all you have to do is estimate mu. That's <laughs> called the unknown mean. And in another special case, I'm going to make your life easier. I'm going to promise you that the mean is zero. So all you have to estimate is sigma. These are just prototypes for robustly estimating the location and scale for problems, but in high dimensions. So now I can tell you about what's known. So robust statistics is a field that's 50 years old. And you know, if you look at the special case of just the unknown mean, so I've promised you the covariance is the identity, how well can you robustly estimate the mean? So there is one natural thing you can do, which is if the median worked in one dimension, let's use the median in high dimensions. So there's something called the Tukey median, which it's not so important what this is, but roughly what it does is you're given a cloud of points in high dimensions. You look for the point that's the deepest inside. It doesn't even have to be in your collection. So it has to be the one which, over all directions you could project, is the closest to you know, the center. So you want to maximize k so that over all directions, that point has at least k points to the right and left, no matter how you project. So that has wonderful error guarantees. So if you're in the setup where an adversary corrupts an epsilon fraction, you get O of epsilon close to the unknown mean. But there's a big problem with this, which is that uh, it's NP hard. So in fact, uh, in order to compute it, the best known algorithms run in time n to the d, where n is your number of samples. So basically, you're dead as soon as you're beyond dimension six. 
in fact, even before that. Now, there's something else you can do, which is, you know, that's just one way to generalize the median. So another way that you could generalize the median is in a way that it's obviously easy to compute. I can do something like the geometric mean. You can think about this as just, you know, in a d-dimensional problem, I could compute the median along each coordinate direction independently and then take the concatenation of those values. That's obviously efficiently computable because it's just d one-dimensional problems. But the trouble is that an adversary could actually set up their corruption so that they're not aligned with any of the coordinate axes and they're actually hard to find those directions. So along each of the coordinate axes, it would look like a very small corruption, but not along that non-axis the line direction where who knows where it is. So the real trouble is that if you're epsilon close to a Gaussian in high dimensions, how close does this method get? It gets epsilon times root d. You don't see that d when you're in one dimension, but you really do see it when you're in high dimensions. And this is really fatal for reasons that I'm going to get into later. But already you can talk about exactly this trade-off, that you go down this laundry list of things which are known, and they have exactly this trade-off. There are other things you can do called tournament estimators, chef estimators. They get great error guarantees, terrible running time. There are trivial things you can do, like you can remove points that are just extremely far away from everything else that's going on. Those get exactly the same trade-off. So maybe this is just fundamental, right? So maybe we can call this a type of price of robustness that to summarize, all the known estimators are either hard to compute in the sense that you need end of the D time, or they lose a polynomial in D factor in their robustness guarantee. So maybe robustness is a pipe dream, something we know is information theoretically possible, but it's just never reachable. And one way to think about this, just to put this in perspective about how bad this is, is the total variation distance between two distributions is only ever at most one. So in order to get non-trivial guarantees, what I'm really saying is that the fraction of errors I can tolerate is at most one over root d. So when you're in hugely high dimensional problems, all of a sudden you can't tolerate very large amounts of error. So that's what the main content of this talk is, is robust estimation algorithmically possible in high dimensions. I'm an algorithms person, so I probably wouldn't be giving this talk unless there was a positive answer, uh, and there is. So here's a result joint with Ilias Diakonakolis, Jerry Lee, Gautam Kamath, Daniel Kane, and Alistair Stewart. It actually is proved by two independent groups, and then uh, we have pretty complementary techniques. So we wrote a paper together. But if you're given a polynomial number of samples, uh, where so D is the dimension, so it's a polynomial in the dimension and one over the target accuracy epsilon, from any distribution that's epsilon close in total variation distance to being a Gaussian, then there's an efficient polynomial time algorithm, no more end of the Ds here, which outputs estimates mu hat and sigma hat so that you're close within total variation distance, not within O of epsilon, but within epsilon times a polylog in one over epsilon. So all of a sudden, we've removed all of the dependence on the dimension. So you can actually get meaningful robustness guarantees with universal constants, amounts of corruptions, that are independent of the dimension. And there are some extensions that I'm not going to talk about where you can actually weaken the assumptions to things which are sub-Gaussian or have bounded second moments. You get weaker guarantees, but the techniques I'll give you do extend to uh, other setups as well. So around the same time, uh, Lai, Rao, and Vampala gave also agnostic learning algorithms. So they measured it in parameter distance, where the way to think about it is that if you're epsilon close to the original distribution, Roughly what they get is root epsilon. So it's off by an extra, you know, instead of epsilon to epsilon, it's root epsilon. But it also almost entirely removes the dependence on D, except for this uh, small little root log D factor. And there have been a lot more works after this, which I'm not going to talk about, where you can, once you know that you can do things in high dimensions robustly, you can do all sorts of things like tolerating larger fractions of errors that get close to one, but where you output a list of hypotheses instead of one. There are things where you can show lower bounds against efficient algorithms through something called statistical queries. You can weaken the distributional assumptions. You can ask how it interacts with sparsity. And you can work with more complicated generative models, like independent component analysis and so on. Yep? In your theorem, could you tell me exactly what the assumptions are on the dependence of the mean and the covariance as the dimension grows? In terms of the parameter distance, let's say. As in, like, how I'm measuring the distance? No. You have a family of mu 
uh, sure. But so here the setup is that um, you're in some fixed dimension. For any fixed dimension, when you're given samples from a distribution that's epsilon close to a Gaussian, then there is an algorithm at that dimension that outputs mu hat and sigma hat that satisfies this error guarantee. So would you gain anything by looking at this across? So it could be a different algorithm to every different dimension. It's um, not really going to be different, but yeah, it's, uh, it's only going to be different in the size of the matrices and you know, the, the moments that it computes. Um, but it'll be the same family of algorithms across different dimensions. Maybe we can clarify that later. Yeah. All right, great. Any other questions? Uh, what yeah. about cross correlations between uh, different dimensions? Yeah, so um, what's really important in order to get this kind of error guarantee is that you have to be able to detect corruptions which are not axis aligned. So embedded in this theorem, when you're given something that's only promised to be epsilon close in TV to a Gaussian, the way the adversary could have added corruptions could be arbitrarily correlated along the different axes. So there's no constraint on how the adversary has added the corruptions, and that's why it's baked into the setup of the problem. Thanks. Yeah? And just to make sure, epsilon you know, the algorithm knows epsilon, or it's sort of agnostic? So you don't need to know epsilon. I'm going to describe it as you know epsilon, but uh, that's one of the things that you can sort of fix, even if you had it another way. But thanks. All right, great. So uh, what I really want to do is, you know, that's uh, it's a pretty long paper. But what I want to do is I want to explain the way that you can suddenly solve these types of problems. Because actually, there's a recipe. Now, this recipe is the thing that's going to work for a lot of different problems. And it's going to be kind of mechanical eventually once we figure it out. See, I mentioned that it's really important to think about things in total variation distance so that you're not accidentally hiding dimension-dependent factors in the way you've set up your problem. But actually, the first thing to do is to figure out what's the right parameter distance to actually care about that's related to total variation distance. That's step one. Step two is actually the main content of all of these algorithms, is we're going to do something more naive. So we're actually just going to try and use the empirical mean or empirical covariance but we're going to be adaptive. We're going to try and figure out when our estimator has been compromised. And when it has been compromised, we're going to be able to make progress by actually getting rid of some of the corruptions and purifying our samples. So we're going to use this power of adaptivity to get us around this trade-off between robustness and computational efficiency. So let's do it in the simplest setting, where it's a little bit easier to visualize what's going on. Let's do it in the case where we just have the unknown mean. So we just want to estimate mu, and our covariance is the identity. The first step is pretty mechanical, is we want to figure out what's the right way to measure parameter distance so that it captures total variation. So one of the basic facts, which is actually pretty intuitive, is that if you have two Gaussians, both with the identity as the covariance matrix, their total variation distance behaves roughly like their Euclidean distance. Because along that direction where they differ, that's where they're going to be statistically different. You can prove this for those of you who know these types of things using something called Pinsker's inequality. The KL divergence between two Gaussians is a nice closed form. You plug it in and you relate it to TV. But what this really tells us is it tells us what our goal should be. Is that in this more convenient way of measuring closeness, all we want to do is we want to get epsilon close in Euclidean norm without Ds showing up. So this is our new goal. And now let me move on to the meat, the main step, which is step two, which is you know, how can you detect when your naive estimator has been corrupted? So there's a lot of counterintuitive stuff that happens to the geometry of distributions in high dimensions. So a high dimensional Gaussian looks like a ball of radius root d. So if you think about it, you know, how could an adversary really corrupt taking the empirical mean is if the distribution, the Gaussian, looks like a ball of radius root d, he could add his corruptions along one single direction. Right? Now, here I've color coded it with the black points are the uncorrupted ones, the red ones are the corrupted ones. But what's important is that if I didn't color code it, you wouldn't be able to tell where the corruptions are because they're really in the right shell ball around it. There's nothing that alone tells you this one point is an outlier. They're all in roughly the right place. The thing that's going to tell you that your empirical mean has been moved by so much, and this is where the epsilon root d comes in, is he has an epsilon fraction of points, and he can put them all root d distance away, so you move by epsilon root d. 
The point is that what tips you off that something has gone wrong is that along this direction, the variance will be really skewed. It was supposed to have the identity covariance, so it should have variance one along this direction. But when the adversary has collected all their corruptions along a low dimensional thing, you don't know individually what are the corruptions, but you know that there's a lot of them there because your variance is way off from what it should be. So this is a very simple win-win algorithm now. This is the key lemma. This is the maybe main mathematical thing I'm going to say, is that if you take samples, something that's epsilon close to being a Gaussian, then you have this nice property that if you take the empirical mean mu hat, some of those are corrupted points, some aren't, and you take the empirical covariance, sigma hat, then if your mean, mu hat, your estimate is way off from the true mean, it's off by not epsilon, but epsilon root log one over epsilon, then your second moment is off too. Then if you take sigma hat and look at the spectral norm of that minus the identity, it's at least epsilon times log one over epsilon. So the way to think about this is that if an adversary can tamper with your first moment, there's an echo or evidence of what he's done in your second moment. So you're going to use the second moment as a way to purify your samples and make progress towards getting the true mean. So what do you do to put it all together is now there's a very simple algorithm. Well, you either find good parameters or you remove a lot of outliers. So you know, imagine that uh, you compute the empirical mean, you compute the empirical variance, but the trouble is that the second moment is off from what it should be. You know you're in danger here. So what do you do? All you do is you take the direction v, which is the largest variance, and along that direction your variance is too large and the main culprits are going to be the outliers. So what you can show is that you can find a threshold t so that when you throw out points above that, well, you're not going to throw out none of the inliers, but you're going to throw out at least one outlier for every inlier you throw out. So in this way, you're making your set of samples more pure by throwing those things out. And eventually, you're going to run out of outliers to throw out. So eventually, when you finish this, you're going to have certifiably good parameters and whatever's left over. So these things are a little bit complicated to actually push through and get a full proof because there are all sorts of nasty things that can happen, like you know, can the adversary buy the things that they add in? Can they change which directions you look at and which sets of the inliers are left over at the end of the day? What you can show are things like whatever set of inliers you're left over with is actually a good estimate for the true mean. And then you end up with algorithms which run in polynomial time in n and d, and whose sample complexity depends polynomial in all of the parameters too. So this is uh, maybe the warm-up case. I'm going to give you a hint about what happens for the second moment, because that's actually where some interesting math comes in once you have this general recipe. But uh, let me tell you at least at a high level what happens to the unknown covariance. So I promised you, you know, there's this recipe, and we're just going to keep going back to this recipe. So let's just try and do the same thing. We're in the situation where the mean is promised to be 0. We don't know the covariance. We want to robustly estimate the covariance without d showing up. So we do the same thing where we find the right parameter distance for measuring closeness and covariance. It works out to something a little bit funny that you might not have expected, uh, where you take sigma and you take sigma hat, and what you really look at is you look at this way of measuring closeness, where you take sigma hat to the minus 1 half times sigma times sigma to the minus 1 half. You look at how close that is to the identity. This is called the Mahalanobis distance. It's actually quite natural. Because the idea is that if you get the variance wrong in some direction where the variance is really small, then you would end up with the ratio of the two variances here because you are very statistically far. So this is just the right way to measure closeness and parameters is using the Mahalanobis distance. But this tells us that that's what we should care about for removing dimension dependent factors. And here's the you know, main idea, of course, is the step two about how do we detect when our empirical covariance is wrong. So let's pretend we were actually given samples from n of 0 sigma. So you know, we could compute this naive estimator of the empirical covariance. And the key fact, this is kind of the last mathematical thing I'm really going to say, is that if you were to take samples, you know, the idea is pretty simple. See, when we were trying to figure out the first moment, we saw an echo of the tampering in the second moment. Let's do the same thing here. If we want to see if there's tampering in the second moment, let's see if there's an echo in the fourth moment. Now, fourth moments are really tricky because tensors lead to all sorts of computationally hard optimization problems. But here's the key lemma. 
So if you take samples from this Gaussian n of zero sigma and you compute a matrix that expresses its fourth moment. So x is a length d vector and you take its tensor with itself, so that's a length d squared vector. And you take it times its own transpose, so that's a d squared by d squared matrix. Then actually restricted to the right subspace, that matrix has a very nice analytic form. So what it has is it has um, some term, which looks like two times sigma tensor with itself, so it's a d squared by d squared matrix. And then you have this other funny thing. See, I used the flat symbol to denote that you're flattening a matrix. So sigma is a d by d matrix, but you rearrange it into a vector, which has length d squared, that's why I have the flat symbol, and then take it times its own transpose. And this is analytically what this form looks like, but it tells you something interesting which is if you think about the spectral properties of this matrix M, then actually the spectrum is dominated by this last term because that's a rank one matrix. The rest of it is a higher rank matrix. So what it's saying is that one of the difficulties in detecting you know, corruptions in high dimensions is that a lot of it can hide under the shadow of this much, much larger term. So there's a trick, which is once you know this analytic form, there's actually a way to project out this piece. So I'm obviously not going to prove this fact, but um, it turns out there's a nice way to think about it, which is, uh, let me say something a bit pedantic, which is, see, in one dimension, when you have a Gaussian, which is n of 0, 1, the fourth moment is 3. And there's actually a very close connection between perfect matchings and moments of Gaussian. So the reason that the fourth moment is three is because if you take a complete graph on four nodes, there are three perfect matchings. And these same types of connections generalize the higher dimensions where you can compute the moments of high dimensional Gaussians using sums over perfect matchings, and that's where these formulas come from. So but what this tells us to put everything together is if you give me a bunch of samples, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute the empirical second moment, sigma hat, then I'm gonna apply sigma hat to the minus one half so that if that really were the right covariance, things would be an isotropic <laughs> position. And then all I do is I compute restricted eigenvalues once I project out this larger term. And if those restricted eigenvalues are too large, it's the same type of tampering that my empirical second moment I know has been corrupted. So it takes a little bit to analyze it, but the same sort of paradigm works when you go from second to fourth moments. And what's neat is that these two special cases, the unknown mean and unknown covariance, directly can be assembled to give you the overall algorithm. So when both mu and sigma aren't known, all you do is you first use a doubling trick. You take two sets of samples, and when you subtract them, that's like getting samples from something that's close to being a Gaussian with mean zero, because you're canceling out the mean. So you robustly learn its uh, covariance. And then you use that robust covariance to find the right transformation so that the actual covariance is close to the identity. And then you end up with an algorithm for the full case where both the mean and covariance are unknown. So this is uh, how the theoretical work you know, goes about. I hope I gave you an idea about the main ideas, what becomes challenging in high dimensional robust estimation. One of the really cool things about this is that it actually has some neat practical applications too. So let me show you those. So I'm gonna give you two families of experiments. So the first one is, see, we can always make our life easy. Let's start off with synthetic experiments. See, we started off with this idea that we're given things which are from a corrupted Gaussian. So why don't we set up an experiment where we're actually given samples from a corrupted Gaussian? And we can see you know, whether the things which are out there really do have this bad dependence on the dimension and whether our thing really does remove it. And this is a situation where there is a ground truth because we're generating the samples ourselves so we can check how well we're doing. So in this situation, the algorithm I gave you is this thing called filtering. So you can see its error for 10% error stays very low independent of the dimension. It's pretty flat enough that you might have thought it was the axis. But the other things, you know, popular things like ransack, this is an old approach uh, which works really well in low dimensions, but you can see it has this terrible dependence on the dimension where you're basically getting meaningless guarantees once you're in dimension 100 or higher. We can do the same types of things for the covariance matrix. And again, we have this uh, lack of dimension dependence for the error. In fact, you can even skew the covariance so that it's pretty anisotropic 
And then you can really see the difference between guarantees which depend on the anis uh, anisotropy or not. So now these are synthetic experiments, but now I want to take it one step further, which is see all of these things were a simplifying assumption that you don't actually believe your data when it's uncorrupted is a Gaussian. But a Gaussian is a very good proxy for a lot of high dimensional distributions because when you project on you know, a random direction, you're going to get something pretty close to a Gaussian for many families of distributions. So let's try and use this in real data, which is definitely not Gaussian. So there's this cool experiment, which I really like, which is due to November et al. It's kind of neat if you've never seen it before. So the idea is you take uh, genetic data from this POPRIS project run by the NIH, and you organize it into a matrix. So the columns are people, and the rows are SNPs. So it's a gigantic matrix. And what you do is you take the two largest singular vectors. So you look for the two genetic directions of largest genetic variation, just the simple PCA on this covariance, on this matrix. And if you color code the, you know, the point cloud you get and you project in two dimensions based on where people are from, you get the map of Europe. So that's really neat. Uh, so the two directions of largest genetic variation are geographic. Awesome. So these are in extremely high dimensional spaces, but this is one situation where you can ask questions like, and by the way, the study is called Genes Mirror Geography in Europe. Now, I don't want to get into the science of whether this is meaningful or not. The point is that it's a great test bed for trying to understand whether robust estimation in high dimensions can give you new ways of exploring high dimensional data sets that you can't visualize naturally. This is a two dimensional projection of a gigantic dimensional data set. So one thing we can do is, because there really isn't a lot of empirical work in robust statistics beyond dimension six, we can ask whether we can find these types of patterns in the presence of noise. So what happens if the data set is not as well curated as it was through this NIH project? We can add our own noise and ask whether we can find these same types of patterns. So when we add 10% of our noise, all we have to do is we choose some direction in high dimensions that's not axis aligned and add a bunch of corruptions correlated along that direction. It's like some sort of subpopulation that's skewing your data. And you, know, you don't even add that much noise because the norm of the noise will be smaller than the norm of the signal so that you can't obviously pick it out. But the point is that PCA is going to be spectacularly corrupted because as soon as you add correlations along this non-axis line direction, you're going to really rotate the singular vectors in a way that the pattern becomes completely absent. So if you had this kind of noise in your data and you were doing high dimensional data analysis, you would not find the scientific phenomenon of genes mirroring geography. So it definitely looks nothing like the map of Europe. You can try out things like RANSAC. RANSAC is essentially just a repetition of PCA, so not so surprising it doesn't work. You can try out robust PCA approaches that use semi-definite programs. A lot of those don't have a dependence on the dimension as much as they have a dependence on the rank of the underlying covariance matrix, which shows up in the error guarantees. And you get something that's better. It somewhat looks like Europe. But uh, certainly, you wouldn't look at this thing and think Europe. And if we use our methods, we end up getting something that looks very similar to the original thing in spite of the fact that we have 10% noise. Now, I have to apologize. We lost Turkey. But uh, Turkey only had four people. So <laughs> it's OK. Uh, this was only 1,400 people or something like this, so this isn't a giant experiment. But uh, you know, this is, for me, one of the exciting things about this is that, see, when you set up robust statistics as the way it was done in Tukey's time or Huber's time, you know, if you cast the problem in too general a set, then you're going to be stuck with computationally hard problems. But that doesn't mean there are not ways to try and make distributional assumptions, like your epsilon close to a Gaussian, that all of a sudden, these problems which are wildly impossible become possible. Where you can actually see the you know, value of these techniques, both in synthetic plots, which don't have this dimension dependence, and on real data. But you know, one of the things that I'm sort of interested in going forward is there isn't that much work in empirical robust statistics because of these bad dimension dependence. You know, when approaches have been suggested, there's some combination of computationally hard, heuristic, or you know, they only show their bad properties in uh, pretty high dimensional experiments. So you can wonder, you know, what would robust statistics have been doing empirically if they had these types of things beforehand? I think that's a really interesting question moving beyond these sort of uh, concocted experiments. And uh, 
I'd love to get your thoughts if you have any on it. But um, you know, this would be really exciting if there are actually some scientific applications of being able to do robust estimation in high dimensions. Because essentially what these methods are, they're ways to search for non-Gaussian projections in high dimensions as defined by things like the discrepancy of fourth moments from what they ought to be. So I'll end there. So what I hope you got out of this was uh, I told you a little bit about uh, robust one-dimensional estimation, uh, things like using the median and median absolute deviation, and what are the guarantees that make those things the, you know, a good approach. But then in high dimensions, we had this tension between robustness and computational efficiency, which we were actually able to get around once we set up the problem the right way. I gave you a general recipe based on restricted eigenvalue problems for detecting when your empirical, your naive estimates have been corrupted. And I gave you some applications to things like genetic analysis, but uh, what else one can do with this uh, is an open question.